Trump's ex-campaign manager, Paul Manafort, really doesn't have to testify at his federal tax and money laundering trial. His $15,000 ostrich leather jacket says it all. Next on The PETA Podcast. Welcome to The PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo, your host for this behind-the-scenes look at PETA, the largest animal rights organization in the world. Here we talk to the key players at PETA and the movement and ask them about how animal rights change their lives and how they stay motivated to make the world a better place for the animals. On today's episode, the ostriches that died for the jacket of ex-Trump campaign chair Paul Manafort and the PETA investigation that revealed the cruelty behind the fashion. You know, at this one place, they would slide the door open and pull an ostrich in just by grabbing his feathers, slam him into a a padded kind of frame where they would then latch it shut, put the bird's head into a stunner, and then turn the whole bird upside down. And then they would let the bird out, who was now hopefully stunned. Another worker would cut his or her throat. And then another one would stab them in the chest to try to get more blood flow. Investigator Hannah Shine and her husband, Philip, revealed to the world the obscene way ostriches are slaughtered at a South African processing plant, where up to 90 percent of the ostriches used in fashion are killed. More on that. But ostriches are just one example and covered by the Shines. They've also documented the inhumane shackle and hoist slaughter method in South America, which helped change the importation laws of kosher meat to Israel. Recently, kosher officials in the U.S. decided to follow suit and stop importation of beef processed by the shackle and hoist method as well. The Orthodox Union, which is the largest certifier of kosher food in the United States and the world, actually, finally agreed to no longer certify shackle and hoist kosher beef for the U.S. market or for any market. But 30 percent of the meat that the OU certifies um, for U.S. consumption was coming from South America and was being killed in that cruel way. And so can people with confidence when they get their kosher beef hot dogs, if that's their their bent, uh, can they be confident there was no shackle and hoist methods used in those kosher beef hot dogs? Allegedly, after the end of September, they're they're going to be decertifying it. So they should there should not be any new meat coming in. But of course, you know, you can have frozen product last for years in in stores and distributors. So, uh, you know, the best and kindest thing people can do, regardless of the slaughter method, is just not eat cows or, you know, cow's milk, because really, you know, none of it is good. Shackle and hoist is the worst of the worst. But even a rotating slaughter pen or even an upright slaughter pen you know, you're still killing animals who don't want to be killed. They're still being transported cruelly. Um, they're still being raised mostly on factory farms. So the kindest thing to do is to really try all of the different vegan options that are kosher certified from companies like Gardein and Tofurky, Light Life, Daya, uh, Follow Your Heart. You know, there's plenty of options. And I have some favorites. I like this uh, one that's done by a group, I think they're out of California, the, the, the field roast folks. They make a frankfurter. Yes, field roast is amazing. They don't, I don't think they have kosher certification. So for the people who are interested in that, they have to wait a little bit longer for field roast to get certified. But yes, there are so many vegan options. And I do know people who keep kosher who don't mind sometimes that products aren't certified if they're in factories that are all, you know, all vegan products anyway. So yeah. it's, it's really just what um, what people are comfortable with. So the Shines have been busy of late, seeing how their work through PETA has had an impact. But it's nothing like the awareness boost that that Manafort ostrich jacket has provided, shining a light on the horrors of the fashion factories that raise and kill ostriches. That's next on The PETA Podcast. But first... Thanks again for joining us here at the PETA Podcast. Please share a link with your friends and let them know the animals have a voice on the PETA Podcast. Go to our webpage at PETA.org and binge on some of my favorites. Got to listen to the first episode with PETA president and co-founder Ingrid Newkirk, who debunks all the myths you've heard about PETA and animal rights. 
Hear her directly on No Kill Shelters on Episode 1. My friend David Felbin was surprised PETA didn't approve. Well, he should listen to Episode 1. And hear Ingrid's words on why mothers on the southern border should never have been separated from their children. That's on Episode 24. A cow is a child is an immigrant. If you want to hear more about laboratory testing, find out how millions of lives could be saved by using available non-animal tests. So why are some slow to change? Listen to episode 23, PETA Saves Millions of Lives. Remember, if you're on Apple Podcasts, don't forget to rate and review the show. It helps the algorithm know that PETA has a podcast on the issues important to you. Now, if you really want to help the animals, you can always hit the Donate Now button at PETA.org. And if you're high-tech and have Amazon's Alexa, it's as easy as saying, Alexa, donate to PETA. And now to our episode. Undercover investigator Hannah Shine talked to me about going to South Africa and seeing ostriches in the wild, and then comparing that to the feedlots of factory farms, where genetically modified ostriches are killed for their feathers, their meat, and their bumpy skin, the kind that becomes Paul Manafort's $15,000 jacket and makes the news as a worldwide symbol of excess, criminality, and cruelty. Here's investigator Hannah Shine on this episode of the PETA podcast. It was in 2016 that I voiced a a project for PETA, and you were the head of that project, you and your, your husband, Philip, that right. involved ostriches in South Africa. And it really was, I was just amazed at the footage you got, the information you got, and it really was, and people can see it, it's on YouTube, they can see it at PETA.org, but it was the first time these kind of pictures were revealed to the public, right? It was. We were really able to do a surprisingly comprehensive peek into this industry. We didn't know setting out that we'd be able to see quite so much, but we saw everything from hatcheries to, you know, from incubators to the babies being kept in cement essentially enclosures to um, the breeding side of it. We saw the transportation on, um, you know, on trailers. We saw the slaughterhouses, you know, really including, you know, going to boutiques and seeing the finished products. You know, that's, um, <laughs> that's bad enough being surrounded by animal skins, but, you know, seeing every step of it. And, and then the pleasure of it was getting to see wild ostriches so we could compare and juxtapose the, mm-hmm. their lives in the wild versus what we were seeing in these captive situations. And it was night and day. And what was that like? Because ostriches in the wild versus seeing them all penned up Mm -hmm. in essentially factory farmed, it must've been not, not just night and day must've been really startling. huh? It was the, the ostriches in the wild can live upwards of 40 years or more. They are excellent parents. They, They pair up and they take care of their babies together. And one thing we saw in the wild, we had, driven up on a, a female ostrich and she quickly when we kind of parked to admire her she quickly walked into an area where we couldn't really see anything and then suddenly a male ostrich popped up and then she popped down and we could only see her head and we realized she was going to sit on the nest and then the male got up and he started walking away very ostentatiously wagging his wings and kind of luring us saying come look at me I'm I'm so interesting and luring us away from the nest and it worked, you know, we, we, we respected, we respected that. So we, um, we kind of moved away from, from the nest area and then just stopped and admired him walking away. But it was very strategic and intelligent behavior that we saw. Well, it sounds like uh, a kind of, yeah, a distraction, right? It, it was a defensive yeah. and yet aggressive distraction by the show of right. his plumes <laughs> to protect the, the, the female. I was kind of fascinating there it was he wasn't coming at us he was actually leading us away and kind of just you know wagging his wings and and trying to get our attention so that was fascinating and um in another we we actually fell in love with africa doing these investigations and so on another trip we were actually near the cape of good hope on a national Mm -hmm. park there and uh driving towards the tourist area where you can see the, the southernmost point of africa we saw four ostriches, you know, grazing and 
stunning. And then uh, I turned to my right and one of them was lying on the beach. And I just thought, wow, that, you know, on one side, they're eating flowers. On the other side, they're, they're stunning on the beach. So, you know, just such a contrast from being kept in these dirt feedlots. And, you know, in the wild, they'll raise their chicks till they're about three, till they're really, you know, grown up and able to go make their own families. And in captivity at these factory farms, they take the eggs from the breeding pairs and they, mm-hmm. these chicks are reared in, in buildings and they never, ever meet their parents. You know, they never get to have that family experience. So they're just raised in these, uh, eventually, you know, first they're in a cement enclosure and then they're, they're put out on, you know, the ones we saw were like just dirt feedlots, essentially with rubber truck tires in which they had poured feed. And there was no greenery visible within the boundaries of these factories. There were just, you know, just dirt fields. We're just so, super lacking in any enrichment at all. I mean, but basically, they, the first eggs were started or were captured by these companies years ago. And they've just managed to keep this, this closed circuit, that, you know, generations within this closed circuit of factory farms. They don't infuse them with more. They don't go out in the wild and get more and bring them in. Right. I think they've actually ca- uh, crossed a few different ostrich lines. So mm-hmm. the ostriches in the farms are not exactly genetically uh, similar to the, the different wild species, but they've kind of crossed them to make the biggest ones that have the most favorable genetics for right. leather or for feathers or whatever. You know, they're breeding them for essentially three purposes. Right. So the leather, the meat and the, and the feathers. And so the, the, we're really talking about uh, the Frankensteining of the ostrich. Right. I mean, you and I wouldn't be able to tell that they're different than than the wild ones. But, you know, whatever it is they've done is is just to to cross them in a way genetically that, that that works for them. You know, these these animals, they get tagged in the back of the neck with a plastic tag when they're young. And so they're they're kind of tagged like merchandise. And, and they, I'm sure they I didn't see that, but I'm sure they have, you know, punched it through their skin and it stays with them until they die. And we saw birds pecking at each other's tags because really that's the only thing they had to do in in these yeah. barren environments and then some males we saw uh, adult males who were used for breeding we saw these plastic clips on their beaks that were actually uh inserted into their nostrils and would kind of extend over the front of their beak and we looked that up and that turns out to be a um a guard against inflicting any damage on their own skin or their mm. the neighbors in their same corral their skin. Well yeah, got it got to protect the investment, right? <laughs> right. I get I but mean they look pretty but, uncomfortable. But but basically these are GMO gen- genetically modified ostriches. So they would be GMOOs. <laughs> I Did suppose that? so. GMOOs, I guess. <laughs> uh, I, I don't want to make light of it, but it, you know, I a little bit of lightness is necessary because considering the kind of darkness that you see when you when people see the the investigation and and the things that you right. saw i mean i i have a hard time looking at the the pictures of what happened to the ostriches and it's it's not really funny but tell me we're going to get into that in a second but when you heard about the ostrich jacket of paul manafort costing $15,000 i mean mm-hmm. That must have hit you, like, because you you've seen you've seen the origin, right? You've seen the 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 place yeah. where these things uh, take place. There's where they start. True, and the the companies we documented were the two largest in the world who who do supply all the so called luxury brands, like the one that he would have purchased. When you heard about Paul Manafort's fifteen thousand dollar ostrich skin coat. I mean, it's 15,000. That's cheaper than a Birkin bag. I mean, it sounded to me like maybe were these seconds or what did you think? Well, these products really range in price. Some of the really high end designer so called, you know, luxury bags or coats are, you know, can be tens of thousands of dollars. Other ones are, are more affordable. It just depends on how much craftsmanship so called, you know, uh, work they, they put into them and the, it's really just the brand name sometimes that, that makes it that expensive. I mean, but in the investigation, we talked about Birkin bags, the designer. Right. Right. Because we, we traced this back to Hermes. We 
saw that uh, we had people confirm that they supplied to Prada, to Givenchy, you know, Victoria Beckham, you know, LVMH, Louis Vuitton, you know, tons of these companies and, and, and Gucci as well, who allegedly made the Manafort jacket. You don't usually hear about a coat or a jacket. You usually hear about bags or shoes. I mean, in, in Texas, here in the United States, people know about ostrich boots. I mean, they're, they're so, they, they're so odd looking and yet they're also the highest priced and, and most, uh, valued among the urban cowboy set and in, you know, the Texas and, you know, places like that, yeah. places where you'd, uh, you know, go to a, I don't know, do people still go to mechanical bulls? Do they, is that still a thing? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. It's so, not my speed, but yes, I don't know. I mean, so when you saw this, I mean, PETA had to object to Paul Manafort. It's become almost the, the image, the, like a symbol of Manafort's excess. His, it's become the symbol of the Manafort trial. Yeah, he's a poster child of, of cruelty, like Cruella de Vil, what she did for fur. And she was fictional, but, you know, it's the Manaforting of, uh, of ostrich. And hopefully people will see that as a symbol of how, just how crass and how, I don't know, unappealing it would be to have a product like that and how callous you have to be to, to do that to an animal. It, it is symbolic. It, it defines what someone is like if you wear a jacket or, or if you're capable of wearing something like that. It kind of mm. tells it all, doesn't it, in, in a way? You know, I saw an egret this morning, and it's just the same to me as, as ostrich skin. If somebody would want to wear a heron or a parrot, it just, it's just so gratuitous and unnecessary when there are so many cruelty-free options out there. Tell me about the investigation. You're down in South Africa. It's where 75% of all the ostrich ostriches that are processed for bags and jackets and whatnot, that's where they're, they're processed. Uh, you, right. you talked about what you saw, but tell me about the things that really brought that lump to your throat when you saw that. We were driving from one of the slaughterhouses towards an, another, and it was through a, a mountain pass and it's a very winding mountain road and it's one lane each way. And you were, you know, we're going along and all of a sudden coming the opposite direction, we see these trail, this, this truck with, these, you know, dragging these trailers and you see all these heads poking up above the trailer. And we thought, Oh my God, those are ostriches. <laughs> we were watching an ostrich transport. And so we whipped the car around and we started following them. And I got out my camcorder and, you know, hopefully, you know, they were just thinking we were tourists or, or whatnot, but we were filming them for about 10 minutes and you could see the ostriches, you know, are very standing very erect with their heads out, looking around in a very vigilant position that looked like they were stressed. They were, a lot of them were open mouth breathing, looked like they were panting and there were workers sitting in each compartment of the trailer so that if one of them fell down, if one of the ostriches fell, they could lift them up and they wouldn't be stepped on by other ostriches and, and have their skin damaged. But as we're watching, one of the workers, he's rolling a cigarette and he's smoking a cigarette. And all of a sudden, he just pop, he slaps one of them in the face. Hmm. And I thought, we looked at each other. Did we just see that? And then as we're um, zooming in the camcorder, he does it again, whap, and whacks one in the face again. And I thought, these poor birds are just trying to, you know, trying to survive in this bumpy trailer. And they weren't even pecking him or I don't even what he, know what his thought process was, but just smack this bird twice in the face. It was just So that that was really jarring. And then, you know, these birds are only about a year old when they're killed. So they're not even mature adults yet. And like I said, they've never met their parents. They're kept in these feedlots. So then they're wrangled into a truck. You know, they don't know what's going on and they get to a slaughterhouse. They're let out into a corral and then they're herded up a chute to, to a slaughter, a slaughter room. It was, you know, it's really sad to see, you know, at this one place, they would slide the door open and pull an ostrich in just by grabbing his feathers, slam him into a, a padded kind of frame where they would then latch it shut, put the bird's head into a stunner and then turn the whole bird upside down. Mm -hmm. And then. They would let the bird out, who was now hopefully stunned. Another worker would cut his or her throat 
And then another one would stab them in the chest to try to get more blood flow. So <laughs> as they're doing that, they didn't close the sliding door in between birds. They, they left it open a bit. So all the birds in line can see what just happened to their flock mate. One bird poked his long head in and the worker slapped it. And I thought, you know, <laughs> it's bad enough that they're about to die. Do you really have to bop them in the face? And and so the animals, do they put up a fight? I hope they were insensible from the head stunning. You know, if if they had the settings correct, they it might have been an effective way to desensitize them. But, you know, who knows without knowing the exact settings. It's certainly, they, they wouldn't have had any opportunity to struggle because they're immobilized in this, this metal frame. So from what yeah. we saw after this, after the stunning, they, their head was either kind of um, just hanging down or, or curled up a bit, but it, you know, we couldn't, we couldn't tell any consciousness after that point. And this is something that, as we said earlier, this is a, a rare look at this process because it's not every day that people are able to get photographs or a video of this. And you were able to do that, which it's to true. me sounds pretty easy. incredible. Yeah. But, yeah. but you were, you were easy. able to, you're able to get this and kudos to you for the investigation to open the eyes of the world to this. H how did you pick these companies and how is it that they allowed you to even see this and witness this? We had someone go to leather trade fairs and figure out who the big players were, who supplies whom. And, you know, we already had a campaign against Hermes and other big companies like that because we had exposed their alligator and crocodile supply chains the year before. And so we wanted to really get these companies to stop all exotic skins and to really show them hey, this is what you're buying. I know your suppliers tell you it's all on the up and up, but here's what it really looks like. And then our corporate affairs department, you know, runs with it and meets with all these companies and, and shows them what's really going on. Because when, you know, very often companies are only shown, you know, even if, if they try to inspect, just a very sanitized version of things. And so you just never know what what they what they know or or if they know something's bad and they just claim it's all good. So we, we, one of the reasons we do these investigations is to, to vet these companies' claims about their own practices. So you showed this video to some of the brands, Hermes, uh, Givenchy, um, some of the others, and who stopped and who's still doing it? Let's call out some companies. Uh, who, who are <laughs> the good, good companies question. and who are the, who are the bad companies? I know um, our corporate affairs department works on this constantly, and I think I have a list of who has has given up exotic skins. People should just avoid any of these exotic skins. But then, yeah. you know, so who who makes the honor roll? So a bunch of companies have pledged not to use any exotic skins, and those include H and M, Adidas, Nike, Cole Haan. Um, BB and Abdolfo Dominguez. Some of these I've heard of, some of them I haven't, but yeah, we have a list on our website and, and if people want to see which, which companies are doing the right thing, uh, they can go to PETA.org for more information. But Birkenbag still? No, they, they are not exotic skin free. They still use, unfortunately, um, crocodile, um, ostrich. Cow, calf. They've been very recalcitrant. Now, you did a follow up. The company that you went to, Klein Carew, I think it was? Klein Carew and Mostrich were the two companies we investigated who together account for reportedly between 75 and 90% of the ostrich products in the world. And this is mm -hmm. back in 2016. And now, yeah. what, what has happened two years later? How, what has the impact been on the, on? on their business? Well, a month ago, apparently, they announced that due to declining demand for ostrich products, that they are going to merge to, to stay afloat in this dying industry. Yeah, are, are we correct to imply that the PETA investigation and just letting people know about how ostriches are processed and how 
what they go through in order to be uh, in order to get people their ostrich products, that it's had some impact. I mean, I certainly th- you know think so. I mean, PETA's slogan should be providing subdued demand since 1980 for animal products because <laughs> I feel like you know that's this is what the the CEO of one of the companies said that due to outbreaks of avian influenza and subdued demand for exotic leather at the moment, that they're having a lot of trouble and that they need to merge in order to stabilize the entire industry. So to me, that says, well, somebody's had an influence on subduing this demand. So I certainly think our investigation helped open people's eyes. You know, I think a lot of people are also surprised to hear that ostrich is being used to make clothing because people, they might think of the feathers, but the skin, I don't know. I, I just don't think people see the, unless they know about ostrich boots. What is your, your feeling on that? Do most people know about that? Or are they surprised when you tell them about, hey, look, ostriches? Yeah, I think they've probably heard of ostrich boots. And you see it a little bit in wallets and small, small items in department stores that most of us shop at. I don't think we know many people who have a full ostrich handbag or ostrich leather seats in their cars or other ostentatious pro- products like that. But I don't, I don't swim in the pool of people who, um, <laughs> who can afford that kind of thing. So, <laughs> yeah, well, well, neither I. You know, I have to say that when I was in Texas in my youth, I did see people with ostrich boots, and I thought I used to think, you know, before I was married to Pete, I, I used to think it was oh, it's kind of cool, and then I saw the price tag, and I was in shock, but. Well, they look fascinating. I mean, the, the, the color, I mean, the, the pattern of dots mm-hmm. is very unique among leather. And if you, if you see it, it's striking, it's new, it's novel. But if you, if you really know why that's there, it, it, those are the quill follicles where the feathers had been ripped out from their skin. So once you know what's behind it, it's not quite so charming. Right. Or as my friends like to say, they, they look like venereal warts. If you, <laughs> you need an image to make it worse than it is or to make it as bad as it really is. It's, there's nothing pretty about it. But, yeah. Yeah. you know, in the, in the video that you did, I have to say, the, the shot where you're showing the back of the ostrich and there's a guy off camera who says, there it is. This is the money. The diamond area. Yes. Yes. I mean, that's, I mean, it looks like, you know, I also lived in Hawaii and there's this expression about people getting chicken skin, you know, when you get chills up your spine. Sure. Goosebumps. And chickens. Right. Yeah. Goosebumps. Right. But this mm-hmm. is, this is like 10 times or a hundred times goosebumps, right? This ostrich right. bumps are, yeah. this is like the gold mine for some people when they see it, they get, they get the skin. And they sell it for jackets and boots and purses. And it's, it really, and it's a small part. It really is a small part of the ostrich, just the back. Yes. It's this diamond shaped area on the back that has the biggest follicle, you know, dots. And it's, he did, he said to us, this was a plant manager giving us this tour. He said, this is where the money is made. And it really brought home to me that we needed to educate people about exotic skins more that more so than ostrich meat or ostrich feathers which are all part of their revenue stream but it's it's the the, the back the skin on their backs is the premier you know part of of the ostrich the most valuable part now you mentioned the feathers and people might have seen feathers ostrich feathers not not necessarily peacock feathers but ostrich feathers at uh, like Carnival or Moulin Rouge, you, you mentioned it in the piece that there's a lot of uh, the fancy ostrich feathers are are in demand by uh, plumy type uh, type of uh, uh, enterprises. Right. Even the not so fancy feathers are in high demand. You know, people might recognize ostrich feathers in in the uh, boas, you know, those long scarves. Mm. They're those very fluffy looking feathers where you don't really see kind of a boning pattern at all. It's just these long kind of tendrils of fuzz. So those are ostrich feathers, the ones you see in big plumes hanging off of, you know, showgirls, things like that. But it's Mm. the body feathers that they use for feather dusters. And most people Mm. don't even think, where do feather dusters come from? Those are the body feathers of ostriches that aren't worth as much, but they're certainly, um, you know, used in bulk for for these products. And, and I don't think, I think that's probably the thing that most people are likely to have 
personal interactions with from an ostrich is even if you don't have one at home, I know I've seen in stores where the workers are going around dusting shelves with feather mm-hmm. dusters. And really, you can get a, a polyester one or some kind of synthetic feather duster easily enough, probably cheaper and with less cruelty. Absolutely. All of these ostrich products can be can be duplicated with just as much effect with mm-hmm. not, you know, non-ostrich product. I mean, you wouldn't know that a non-feather boa is is not real. They they make amazing products now that look like ostrich skin, like ostrich feathers. I don't see any uh, Gardein ostrich <laughs> fillets. I was going to ask you about ostrich meat. I mean, people do buy it. I mean, is it a delicacy? Do people, is it seen as an aphrodisiac or something? Or <laughs> what is the appeal of ostrich meat? It depends on the country. They try, the industry tries to sell it as a, a healthier meat, as less bad for you than red meat, let's say. But they had been exporting it to Europe until outbreaks of avian, avian flu caused them to not be able to do that. So people in South Africa eat the meat. Um, in the U.S., there are some domestic producers who are, who are selling it, but I think I honestly think it's just a novelty that people want to be, sound like they're cool going to a restaurant yeah. and eating an ostrich. Steak. And, and certainly the the thing that I have heard of, um, you know, here in the United States, the ostrich cowboy boot. And, you know, that's why I was surprised when I saw, I figured, well, if they make cowboy boots and purses, you, you just need a lot of ostrich leather to make an ostrich jacket, which makes yeah. it even more hideous. I think the the amount it of is. cruelty yeah. that goes into a jacket. Definitely. So who who knows how many birds it took, you know, to make make up the different the sleeves, the back, you know, the front. And we've even seen the ostrich leg skin, which has a much different pattern. It doesn't have those follicles on it. It looks almost more like reptilian skin. And they use that yeah. as like a contrasting a contrasting panel in some of these products. Well, Hannah, I have to commend you and Philip for for leading the charge on, on these investigations. And it really, I was really very impressed when I, I voiced over that uh, that investigation two years ago. Uh, the amount of work and the detail and the footage you got was really uh, incredible. And it must be gratifying to see that it has some impact. I mean, you see the companies merging. You also see how when it's exposed that hey Manafort has this fifteen thousand dollar jacket. I, I don't think there was anyone who said, Oh, how how nice, how how uh <laughs> absolutely uh you know GQ or how you know, how fashionable this was. I th- I think there was a universal condemnation of the fact that he had this yeah. jacket of cruelty. Yes, if anything it just gives good exposure to why normal caring people would not buy this product. And one thing before I let you go, I mean, I know you, you and your husband, Philip have done a number of these investigations, but you, it means that you've seen a lot of the worst that usually people are, are spared from seeing. I mean, when people buy an ostrich jacket or an ostrich purse, they don't see what you saw that makes something like that a hideous thing. And yet you saw it, you captured it, and you let the world see. And so maybe they now can make a moral choice and a moral decision not to partake and not to, you know, wear it, not to do any of that. But you saw it and you have to live with it. How do you decompress or how do you keep those memories separate? from uh, you know your life so that it doesn't debilitate you because i just i can't imagine being there right up front live seeing this happening and because and i invite people to watch the video at peta.org or it's on youtube just put down peta ostrich and or ostriches and people can see the video that has more than 1.2 million views on on youtube alone how do you how do you decompress so that you don't have this affect you? 
sometimes I'll actually click on our action alerts or our different YouTube video versions. Like we have a PETA version, PETA 2, PETA Latino, and I'll tally up the numbers and I'll think, wow, this many million people are now aware of this or this many hundreds of thousands of people have actually taken action and written to Hermes through our website to ask them to no longer use exotic skins. So I sometimes it's numbers that give me comfort. Um, sometimes I uh, think about people who've written in and, and thanked us for opening their eyes. Sometimes we look at the Facebook comments under, you know, under our, um, our videos. Not all of them are enjoyable. <laughs> some, you know, never read the comments because there's always something there that's going to infuriate you. But some of the comments are very gratifying. We just try to think about all the eyes we've opened and um, all the people's minds we've changed. And, it, you know, sometimes people don't intend to be cruel. And so they will Google how a product is made before they purchase it. And if they do take the time to just type in PETA ostrich or ostrich slaughter or anything, they will see what we found. So that's what gives me hope that, you know, anytime we expose an industry that people hadn't really understood, like mohair, angora, uh, down, that our information will be front and center if they make any effort at all to know what they're purchasing. Hannah Shine, thank you very much for being part of the PETA podcast. My pleasure as always. Thanks, Emil. Hannah Shine, who along with her husband, Philip, have produced undercover investigations that have brought to light cruel animal practices like those that produce... Paul Manafort's ostrich jacket. You can see the jacket, then take action, writing to the fashion houses. Go to PETA.org. And that's our show for this time. You can contact us at PETA.org. Find me on Twitter at Emil Amok, that's E-M-I-L-A-M-O-K, or on AMOK.com. Once again, thank you for listening. Check out all our episodes on Apple Podcasts, where you can rate and review the show. It helps get the word out about the issues you care about. And don't forget, you can help the animals and PETA, especially if you have Amazon's Alexa. Just say, Alexa, donate to PETA. Our music is provided by Carbon Works. Check them out on YouTube. And join us again next time for more insight into animal rights and the fight for a cruelty-free world on The PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo.